uh, I am pleased to uh, introduce our speaker today, whom we all know, Walt Meisner, is going to talk to us about the interesting subject of bees, of which there are many, many types and many, many uses and many, many benefits to us. So, Walt, please. All right. Today's talk on honeybees and beekeeping will be presented from an eclectic point of view. It'll look at it from multiple directions. Uh, the Old Guard members have come from a variety of education and career backgrounds, science, engineering, biology, and medicine. This talk will have something for everything, and I hope you will enjoy it. i also like to thank John Mahada. Uh, we, I did a trial run, uh, and he was a good sounding board to help me refine what I talk about today. Okay, as an introduction, if somebody had told me in El High College or later that I would be keeping a box of 30,000 to 50,000 stinging insects, I would have said, no way. Yet here I am. Uh, I got started into beekeeping in a roundabout way. There was a vendor at selling their New Jersey honey at New Jersey Fresh Farm Outlet. They had a small observation hive, which has five frames of comb with bees actively working on it. The observation hive has plexiglass sides on both, so you could easily observe the bees with their daily routines. So they encouraged me to join the New Jersey Beekeeping Association. So as a consequence, I got email from Rutgers. Um, they're starting up their bee gardening, beekeeping course. It's a two and a half day course with class instruction and hive demos given in April and May. Uh, it turned out that the April one was already booked and I was on the waiting list for May, but I did get in. So uh, we had two very good instructors. One was Tim Schuler, the New Jersey apiary inspector, who has now moved on. And uh, Bob Hughes, the former New Jersey apiary inspector. And the course was so thorough, I thought I'd been a beekeeper for 20 years. So I highly recommend it. Um, I, I called up one of the instructors and they came by to survey my property for spring and fall nectar flow. And the other instructor later came to do a hive inspection when I had my beehive set up. So, Norm, so that was in 2008. And of course it was too late to start anything in May, but February, 2009, it was an unusually warm year that time. And um, so I ordered, you know, hive and beekeeping equipment. I already knew what to order. And, you know, the hive equipment come, you know, <clears throat> you know the, hive, the hive equipment comes with pre-cut wooden pieces that need to be assembled. And so while waiting, uh, while doing that, I looked around to get a bee package. So normally these bee packages are ordered in the December of the prior year, and it was very tough to get one in February. But I managed to locate one and actually set up my hive. And later on, I took a second beekeeping course, intermediate beekeeping, which covered queen rearing, swarm control, and hive demos. So just to talk about what will be covered, uh, I'll be covering beekeeping education, practice and experience, economic value to agriculture, environment, and ecosystems, or social insects, honeybee genus grouping, and unusual genetics, honeybee caste system, division of labor, life cycle, and language, beekeeping, that includes hives, bee products, pest management, honeybee diseases, pests, parasites, bacteria, and viruses, honeybee threats, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, pollination services for agriculture, uh, colony collapse disorder, which I'm sure you've all heard of, a threat to agriculture, and beekeeping clubs, orgs, and researchers. Okay. Uh, besides the courses, I became a member of the local bee club. I kept mostly one hive, but two is the recommended minimum. Um, I've taken, you know, started a nucleus hive, split a colony into two hives, harvested honey, propolis, and beeswax. I have planted two apple trees in my front and backyard. Uh, I had to bear proof the bee yard when bears became a problem. I've attended numerous 
talks by bee researchers and attended conferences and read numerous books. Now, the thing I like to emphasize is that after two years of having a hive, um, um, before there were very few insects, occasional squirrels and vegetation. And after two years, there was an explosion of native vegetation, which brings in flowers. And that brought in birds of all types and, and additional insects, brought in record acorn and black walnut harvest which brings in squirrels and chipmunks, which brings in resident foxes and red-tailed hawks. And one time I briefly stopped for two years and the first year was about the same and the second year, it kind of reverted to what it was before. And when I started up again, it took a full two years to get back to that um, lively state. Okay, uh, the economic value of pollination services Insect pollination enables the production of over nine, 90 grown crops in the United States. Globally, 87 of 115 food crops are dependent on pollinators. Pollinators include birds, bats, marsupials, monarch butterflies, insects of all kinds. Um, you know, the contribution to the US GDP in 2014, poll pollinators in general contributed 24 billion to the US economy. Honeybees contributed 15 billion out of that amount. Bumblebees, alfalfa, leaf cutter bees also contribute to that. The one thing interesting about bumblebees is that they're unique as, as they're the only pollinator that can efficiently pollinate tomatoes with their abdominal vibrating technique. Uh, pollination. Pollination is uh, crucial for keeping fruits, nuts, vegetables, and oil seeds in our diet. And the byproducts are honey, valued at about 300 million a year, pollen, beeswax, propolis, and these all go into many products that you may not even know contain these ingredients. Uh, the contribution to the global GDP in 2019 was 235 to 557 billion per year. Uh, managed beehives are the most efficient of all pollinating services. They typically increase crop yields by 10%. And the intrinsic value to food nutrition is actually far, worth far more than the dollar amount contributed. What are the economic challenges to pollination services? Uh, managed beehives have declined over the past 60 years. In 1947, they used to be 6 million. And over the years, when you get to 1990, it dropped down to two and a half million colonies. Some crops are totally dependent on pollination. Almonds are 100% dependent, and they require 1.4 million beehives annually. So without that, you wouldn't have any almonds. Blueberry, squash, watermelon are 90% dependent on pollination. Um, the cacao plant is pollinated on a tiny midge fly. And corn is one of the few plants that can be solely pollinated by the wind. An estimated 10 million beehive losses are valued at about $200 per hive. And commercial beehive losses are typically from 10 to 30% per year. So that's quite a cost to replace. The cost of renting a beehive for almond production, it was $50 per hive. Now it's 150 to 175 per hive at an estimated 210 to 245 million in total cost per year. Okay, how to differentiate a honeybee from other bees? Okay, everybody seems to call every insect, stinging insect a bee, which really annoys me. Um, you know, bee by definition is really an insect that gathers honey and pollen, whether it's a solitary insect or a colony like a honeybee. So just to help you identify them, uh, the upper top right is a European hornet, and I haven't seen one yet. The lower bottom right is a bumblebee. It also looks very similar to a carpenter bee. Um, the middle one is a European paper wasp. They have small colonies made of wood fiber. The upper top left is a bald-faced hornet. I've seen uh, them once or twice in my life. The uh, 
The middle left is a yellow jacket. Those are the ones people are most familiar with. And they're annoying picnic crashes, they're hairless, and little use in pollination. And the lower left is a honeybee. Nice, fuzzy, cute looking. Its fuzzy hairs are electrically statically charged as they fly through the air. And when they land on the flower, the pollen just jumps to them. OK. Um, let me talk about the orisocial aspects of them. There, there are many orisocial insects. They include ants, termites, and honeybees. So orisocial comes from the Greek ori, meaning good and social. It's the highest level of organization. It's defined as having cooperative brood care, overlapping generation of adults, division of labor, into productive and re non-reproductive groups. Um, they exist in insects, crustaceans, and mammals. Some examples are Hymenoptera, which includes ants, bees, and wasps. Isoptera, which includes termites. And rodents, which include the naked roll mat, rat. E.O. Wilson claimed humans have a very weak form of oiso being always social. Uh, they achieve a organization level far greater than a solitary creature can. The whole is the complete organism. The individual is a cell of the organism. OK, so I'm going to give a, a roundabout way of how, uh, how, how honeybee uh, colony organization may have evolved. So I'll talk about solitary wasps. These are wasps. The ones I'm referring to are ones that find another insect, sting it to paralyze it. Um, and they will lay an egg on it. Okay, so what they do is they, they create a recess in the, in the soil to lay their eggs. And so while one is out finding food, the recess may be taken over by another wasp. And when it comes back with a, with, with a prey, it can result in a challenge trying to reclaim that recess in the soil. And if it went, doesn't win out, it'll have to find another recess. And it turns out some solitary wasps will actually, even though they're not related, they'll just work together. They'll have, each will have it, their own recess next to each other. And one wasp will defend both recesses while the other finds the food. And, you know, and this, this is one solution to, that they somehow have adapted to. Now, bumblebees raise a small colony. You know, they have no honey, but you know, the first brood is fed and raised solely by the first female egg layer. The second and subsequent brood is raised and fed by the daughters. The first set of daughters are sterile, but the last batch are viable. So what's happening is this viability is suppressed by a pheromone, which diminishes, diminishes over the course of the summer. And it's the last batch that gets mated and starts a new colony the next summer. Now, if you carry this a step further, you get to what a honeybee colony does. However, to do this, it requires a different kind of genetics, and it requires division between productive and non-reproductive groups. Um, <clears throat> what I'll be covering here is the honeybee genus and classification. I won't go through all, all of it here, but if you look at the family, um, apidae is includes bumblebees, honeybees, stingless bees. The genus is Apis, which is honeybees alone. And then under that are species and subspecies. Now, if you look under species here, you have uh, A. mellifera, which is the Western honeybee. It comes from Europe and it's uh, the early settlers brought it to the US in 1622. Uh, the other one that's become very common is the Italian honeybee. And it's probably the most one used in the United States. Um, A. serrana is the Eastern honeybee. It comes from Asia. Here's a further breakdown of the species and subspecies. I, I won't go into all of them, but you know, but they're here for reference. The one thing I like to point out is 
from these subspecies, they'll make hybrids. So the various hybrids like the buckfast from the UK and the Saskatchewan from Saskatchewan, Canada. And I've actually raised both of them. I'll talk a little bit about the honeybee caste system. There's, there's three castes. You have the queen, the drones, and the workers. The queen is the reproductive female. There's only one per colony. If there are two, they have to fight it out, and only one will dominate. They live typically three to five years, and workers will supersede it if the queen is ailing. The drones are the reproductive males. There are a few thousand per colony. They live in the summer roughly about 55 days. They die immediately after mating, and any that are around or later are kicked out in the fall. Uh, the workers, they're actually sterile females. There's 30 to 50,000 per colonies. In the summer, they live six to seven weeks in the spring, summer, and into early fall. And the ones that emerge last in the fall, they live six, four to six months uh, because they're the ones that, that are going to have to maintain the hive over the winter. The main reason the spring summer ones live so short is because they they're the ones that eventually become foragers and the wing muscles essentially wear out and th that's the reason for their shorter life um, the queen decides whether an egg becomes a male or a female if it's fertilized it becomes a male and that egg can become either a viable queen or a sterile worker if it's not fertilized it becomes a male um, now, now it's really the workers that decide because what they do is the drone needs larger cells to be raised in and, and they make the larger cells at the periphery and the queen will automatically not fertilize those eggs. The workers decide whether an egg becomes another worker or a queen. If an, all eggs get fed royal jelly for the first three days and it's suspended for the rest of the time. But if royal jelly is fed during the entire larval stage for a worker egg, it'll become a queen. And if the colony is doing well and wants to swarm, it'll make queen cells at the bottom. And if the colony is ailing, it'll make an emergency uh, queen cell out of day old existing larva. So here's a picture of what they look like. Uh, this is the coloring of a Italian subspecies, you know, the one that people are most familiar with. They're usually golden in color with black bands. Uh, the only thing I like to point out is if you look at the wings, they, they go straight back. And um, the worker in the drone, they have fuzzy hairs on the thorax, and the queen is the only one that has a hairless thorax. And some beekeepers will put a paint dot on it to mark the queen and different colors reflect which year the queen emerged from. Uh, you know, one reason for doing that is you can tell if a queen was superseded, it also makes it easier to find the queen in a colony. Honeybees have unusual genetics. Uh, I'll just contrast that with mammalian reproduction. Uh, you, you know, m mammals have diploidy genetics. The cells are diploid. So for humans, they have 23 pairs of chromosomes for a total of 46. The gametes, which are sperm or egg, are haploid. So they only have 23. And fertilization re re creates a new diploid cell. And the result is 50% inheritance from each parent on the average. Many insects are very similar, but they have some other complications. Um, the honeybee production, reproduction has what's known as haplodiploidy genetics. So the queen cells are diploid, as are the sterile female workers. Uh, that means all their cells are diploid except for the gametes. And they have 16 pairs of chromosome, which equal 32. The drone cells, all the cells are haploid. Drones have no father, but they have a grandfather, which is kind of unusual. Um, you know, 
you know, the workers inherit 25% genetics from the queen and 50% from the drone, which gives them 75% genetic closeness. So this partially explains why um, <clears throat> the altruistic behavior of a non-productive worker. Um, you know, the one thing about this is when Darwin came up with this theory of evolution, um, he couldn't understand, um, you, you know, you, you know why this would happen. Okay, here's a diagram just to help reinforce the idea. On the top left, you have a diploid queen. In the middle, a haploid drone. On the right, a diploid laying worker. Um, if you look at the cells here, here's a typical cell. Egg cell, it's a haploid egg cell. Here's a haploid sperm cell. It, you know, um, it results in a diploid worker. Here's another haploid cell with a haploid sperm. It results in a diploid queen only if it gets oil jelly for its entire life. Here's an egg that never gets fertilized. It just results in a haploid drone. If the queen should disappear, some the pheromone of the queen will, um, some of the workers will start to become, develop ovaries and start laying eggs. However, they're not able to be mated. Therefore, they can only lay haploid eggs and you only get a haploid drone. So if a colony um, loses a queen, this is like the last, last ditch effort by a colony to pass on its genes. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about the life cycle, the division of labor for worker bees. Workers have specialized structures to carry out various tasks. Uh, they have brood food glands, scent glands, wax glands, pollen baskets, and only the worker has this. The queen doesn't have this. The queen is unable to care for any of the brood. Several tasks are, uh, are they have several different tasks according to their age from one to six weeks. So in the first week, the newbies, they're not ready to become nurse bees because their brood food glands aren't uh, developed yet. However, they go on to uh, clean and polish cells, capping brood, feed and cap the brood, uh, attending the queen as attendants and handling incoming nectar from the foragers, processing it into honey, removing debris, packing pollen, build beeswax comb hives, um, warm air or air condition the hive or ventilate it as needed. And toward the end of their life, they go into more hazardous duty, which means guarding the entrance and going out working as field bees. Okay, here's just a quick picture of a life cycle of a bee. Basically it goes from egg to larva to pupa to emerging. Uh, the pupa is capped with a paper, you know, paper capping here. Um, and it takes anywhere from 14, 16 to 14 days, depending on the cast. And it's not unlike a caterpillar, which starts out as in one form and then, you know, turns into a pupa and finally emerges. And here's just a quick diagram. Uh, the queen takes 16 days, worker takes 21 days, drone takes 24 days. Now, if you're a beekeeper and you're looking at the beehive, you wanna see if the queen is laying any eggs and if there's any brood there. <clears throat> so if you look on the right side, uh, the, you know, the right side of this diagram contains a very small tubular egg and they're very tiny, very hard to see. On the left side, they've hatched into larva. So if you look right here, you can see a very tiny white, white egg here. If you look on the left, you can see a, uh, that egg has hatched into a, a larva and in the beginning it's a C shape and it grows up and gets larger until it's the size of the cell. Um, it goes through several periods of molting and they're called instar one, two, three, four, five. And these larvas are continually fed nutrients by the nurse bees. 
So here's an example of a frame pulled out of a honey, uh, out of a hive. And this is a brood frame. So the central area here, which is sort of beige, is our cap brood. If you look at the top here, um, you know, the whitish covering is wax. And so basically this is wax capped honey. And what you can't really see, but unless you look physically look at it, but this gap in between is usually packed with pollen. And what bees do is they mix the pollen with, with honey and form something called a bee bread that honeybees eat. And this gives them the nutrients they need to be able to you know, survive and, and feed the, uh, the, brood, the larva. The other thing I like to point out is that the, very, the comb here is very regular. All the cells are the same size, the same size whether the brood or for honey, but when they to make comb for drone, they're oversized, and you can see some at the bottom. They're usually done at the periphery here. So here's an example where there's capped, um, capped larvae of all types. So the center here are capped for workers. The drone cell size are bigger, and when they get capped, they look bullet shaped. And the queen cells, and the fact that they're on the face of the comb means that they're emergency queen cells out of day old larva, um, they build this little wax peanut shape coming out of one of the cells. Okay, I'm gonna talk about life in the hive and the summer, spring, summer and fall, uh, you have brood rearing. Uh, they, the nurse bees maintain a constant brood temperature between 93 to 97 degrees. Uh, what I find interesting about this is very close to human body temperature. So this seems to be about the ideal temperature for cell growth. If it's too hot out, they'll circulate and fan the hot air out of the hive. If it's too cold, they'll vibrate the flake muscles to warm up the brood. Uh, the workers are e eager to work and forage between 57 and 100 degrees. Any colder than that, they can't fly any hotter than that, they, they won't do it. Every day about a thousand workers die and the queen lays a thousand eggs to replenish the hive. And, <clears throat> and in the winter, uh, bees will cluster when the temperatures fall down to 54 to 57 degrees and they'll maintain an internal cluster temperature of 81 degrees. So it's, a, it's cooler, but they'll maintain that temperature throughout the winter. They require 70 pounds of honey to survive the winter. They'll feed on honey, vibrate the wing flight muscles to generate heat. And in mid-February, they'll start brood rearing when it's still cold outside, uh, you know, to build up the colony so it's ready to take advantage when the flowers uh, bloom. I'm gonna talk about the nectar, honey and pollen. Um, this should be interesting to the chemists and biochemists in the old guard. Nectar is made out of sucrose, 30 to 35 percent, and water, 60 plus percent. The, um, the honeybee adds enzymes. They add invertase to break down sucrose into glucose and fructose. They add glucose oxidase to convert glucose into two parts. One is gluconic acid which makes the acid acidic. And the other one is hydrogen peroxide, which serves as an antiseptic. They also add an analase to break down starches. And the end result is, is uh, something that's antibacterial with 40% sugar, 3% acidity, acidity, and hydrogen peroxide. Um, so if you look at the honey, honey contains 32% glucose, 38% fructose and 17% water. So the enzymes are added and the nectar is fanned until the moisture content drops to less than 17%. If it's more than 17%, uh, yeast will thrive in it. And so, you know, beekeepers actually have an instrument to check to make sure the honey is below 17%. Uh, 
The honey is capped with wax when ready and stores indefinitely. Um, the, the other thing I like to mention is honey is not fed to infants less than one year old. And that's because the botulism spore is to, you know, pre prevalent to the environment. If it happens to be in the honey, the infant doesn't have enough stomach acid to contain it. However, you know, adults do and there's no problem. The pollen is their protein, contains protein, carbohydrates, lipids, vitamins, and minerals. The bees have an enzyme and gut bacteria to break down the hard coat to get these nutrients. If we were to eat the pollen, uh, we, don't, we wouldn't get much protein out of it. I like to talk a little bit about uh, honeybee communication. They have pheromone chemical. Actually, the one thing I like to you know, mention about honey, honey is not unlike what people do to preserve fruits and vegetables. When they preserve fruits, they make sure the sugar is at least 40 to 50%, so it doesn't spoil. When they preserve pickles, they make sure the acidity is at least 5% with 4.6% pH. Um, and some home canners actually use a wax cap on their canned fruit. So it's really not unlike what honeybees do. I like to talk a little bit about the communication system. Humans have hormones to do signaling between cells and organs via the bloodstream, and this helps regulate sugar levels, blood pressure, bone growth, and all kinds of other stuff. Insects use pheromones to do signaling in the free air, and the pheromones guide the individual behavior of honeybees in the colony. So I'm not gonna talk about all, you know, name them all, but what I will say is, you know, the queen has pheromones. They tell it the hive that the queen is alive and well, they also signal whether the queen laid this egg and not a worker. It's, it's used to attract a circle of workers around the queen to serve as attendants. And it also serves to signal that the queen is healthy. And that, that particular pheromone diminishes with age. And when it's low enough, you know, the hive will supersede the queen. The workers also have a variety of of pheromones, they have an alarm pheromone. They have a come hither pheromone to help bring the colony together if it get the individuals get lost. Um, they have a brood recognition pheromone, which inhibits ovarian development in workers. And and they have wax glands, which are not a pheromone, but helps build the um, honeycomb. The drones also have a similar one that helps them congregate in a drone congregating area. So one of the most interesting aspects I find out is that honeybees have a language. Now, some of you may have heard about this. So I'll give you a little bit of a background behind this. Uh, a person named Karl von Fritsch, who is an Austrian biologist, he, he looked into this. People knew about the round dance, but didn't know what it meant. But uh, he discovered he discovered the waggle dance and he discovered the purpose of both of them. So the round dance is, you know, bee comes back to the hive and it, and it makes it uh, just a round dance on, on the honeycomb. And this basically tells the hive that the nectar source is 100 meters away. Just go out, look for it, you can't miss it. When they come back and they do the waggle dance, that means the nectar source is more than a hundred meters away. And the dance itself indicates the distance, direction relative to the sun and the quality of the source. And the honeybees have a built-in clock. So when they, hours later, they go out and look for it, they compensate for the changes in sun angle. So just to give you a quick idea of how this works, um, you know, here's the sun and here's a flower at an angle at a certain distance. So when the bee comes back, it, it, it waggles its abdomen in a straight line. The length of the line is an indication of the distance. And then it turns around in a half circle and does it again and turns around in the other half circle and does it again. Now the direction that they do their waggle dance in is relative to an angle going straight up 
and straight up is always where the sun is by definition. And this caused quite a controversy, you know, is the dance innate behavior or is it a language? And this other researcher, James Gould, and actually it was a problem not just for honeybees, but for all biological life, you know, how do you determine that? And so James Gould rewrote the book on testing interpretation, and it took 10 years to do this, and the waggle dance won out as a language. So it wasn't just innate behavior. Now here's a diagram of honeybees. You know, at the top left we have, you know, the anatomy. The only thing I like to point out is the honeybees that have mandibles, which are insect jaws, and then they also have a long tongue, which they use to sip honey and nectar or water. And it, and they pull it into something called the honey stomach. And the honey stomach has a valve at the end, so it doesn't go any further. So they're constantly sipping in and regurgitating when they're doing their work. Now, if they actually want to feed, they open the valve up and it'll go into the intestines and they get the nourishment from it. Now, the other thing I like to point out is they have this apparatus, um, you know, for the, their stinging apparatus. I'll talk about that in a little bit. This, this diagram on the upper right shows where all the glands are. And I won't go into all of them. This picture on the lower left, it shows that the honeybee will take the pollen and pack it on its rear legs in little pollen baskets. Uh, this picture on the right, the, the Nazaroff gland or the come hither signal is on the last fold of the abdomen. So it bends its little butt to expose that gland. It does a little headstand and fans its wings. So it drives that signaling out into the air. And this is to, you know, to tell other bees that are looking for the hive where it is. And the one in the middle, lower middle is, you know, the bees have four pairs of wax glands. And here this bee is just making sheets of wax and another worker will take this and make honeycomb out of it. So let me talk a little bit about the stinger apparatus. Now, insects like yellow jackets, wasps, and hornets, they have an, an unbarbed stinger. And they're individuals, so they're really out to protect themselves and not necessarily a colony or, or a nest. And they can sting once and they can sting multiple times. And when they sting, they can pack quite a wallop with one sting. Honeybees are actually different. Honeybees will are out not as individuals, but to protect um, the brood and to protect their honey source. And um, and what they have is they have a they have entire apparatus to to do this job. And when they sting, they actually lose their life. So they they won't sting unnecessarily unless the situation demands it. So on the lower left is a shows a honeybee that's just stung a person. It leaves this whole apparatus in the skin and it basically pulls out the entrail of the bee and the bee's not going to last much longer. Um, the apparatus consists of a venom sac muscles and a ganglion. And, and when initially stung, there's really not much venom at all, but this sac is constantly pulsating you know, and, and pumping in more venom. Um, it has a split barb, which slides past each other. And it's got bar, you know, a, a split stinger, which slides past each other. And it's barbed on the outside. So there's another muscle and ganglion, which slides it back and forth and helps dig it in deeper and deeper. And um, so if somebody's a beekeeper, what they do is if they get stung, they, they smoke the area with um, with their smoker and it masks the alarm pheromone. You know, the alarm pheromone is there so other bees will come along and sting in the same area. And then in order to prevent the venom sac from emptying its load, they usually just horizontally scrape the venom sac off and, and usually there isn't much of a problem. 
and if handy, you can apply antihistamine solution, which reduces it. And um, now people have studied this. The venom contains peptides and toxic proteins. It's about 140, 150 micrograms per event. And they've also tested what the lethal dose 50% is, LD50, which is about 2.8 to 3.5 milligrams per kilogram of human body weight. So I was curious to see what it is for me. <clears throat> I weigh 150 pounds, which is 68 kilograms. And if I do the calculation, I get a range from uh, 1,300 to 1,700 stings before reaching LD50. So you really need a lot of stings to even have an effect. And the question is, is this a problem or is this likely? And in general, it's not. And the reason is honeybees only protect brood and honey stores. The queen won't venture out to sting you. The drones, of which there are a few thousand, have no stingers. And the workers, throughout their short lives, you know, the new bees are underdeveloped. The nurse bees don't leave the brood. Other bees are busy with their tasks. And only the guard and forager bees would risk it, which leaves about 8,000. <clears> but even so, they don't go on a stinging campaign because the hive would lose them and they would lose the precious resource. So only a few are designated to sting an intruder. So in general, I've never gotten stung by my hive. And if I visited other hives and they were feisty bees, I got stung maybe five times. So it's never really been a problem. I'd like to talk a little bit about <coughs> uh, beehives. Uh, the early hives were skep hives, which are made out of um, reed. And you can see an example here. They have an entrance on the front. They're open on the bottom. Here's the bottom view of it. You can see the honeycombs in there. And they usually put sticks in them, and they pull the sticks out to harvest, harvest honey. And the problem with that is you, know, you needlessly sacrifice the honeycomb, and it's a lot of work to build new ones. And they've gone into the pyramids of Egypt, and they found capped honey, and it's still good after 5,000 years. However, in 1852, Dr. Lorenzo Lanstrup noticed that when bees build honeycomb, they maintain a bee, dis bee space of 4.5 to 9 millimeters. So this bee space allows bees to work on adjacent comb surfaces. And the design that this person came up with for the hive is to have wooden frames to hold the comb and to be able to pull it out allow for hive inspections, allow for honey harvest, and keep the comb intact so it can be reused. So this was a big boon, and this is what's used worldwide now. I, I put this picture in because this is a case of what bees do when left on their own. They just build random comb. I kind of like it because it looked like a modern city designed by the architect Frank Geary. And if you look at the top view, you can see that all the comb maintains a bee distance here. So everything is accessible. I'll talk a little bit about the components of a Langstroth hive. So if you look at the top, there's an outer cover. It has a lip on it that goes over the, you know, the part that's below it. It has an inner cover here, which is solid with a little vent here. And the reason you have two, high, two covers is, is the bees will wax everything together and you kind of need the inner cover so you can, so that the, uh, that the outer cover is not waxed in, okay? You can have multiple honey supers. Um, so this is the area that you want the bees to um, put their nectar and cure it into honey. You have an optional queen excluder you want to keep the queen below and not into walk up into the honey frames to, to start laying eggs there. And the bottom, you can have multiple, what they call deep supers. And these are for the brood frames. And then you have a bottom board. And the bottom board is, can be solid or screen. And this can be on an optional stand. So this is a variable height structure. And you add boxes to it as the hive grows or 
and it's the hive collects nectar. This is some of the beekeeping equipment. You know, they use a smoker with a fuel. They have a they have a hive tool to pry uh, the piece, you know, the pieces apart. They have a bee brush to gently brush off the bees. And um, <clears throat> I'll talk about what they wear. They can either wear a full suit, like you see on the right here. It's all white with a screen top on it. Or you can wear a beekeeper jacket, which is just the top part. But then you have to add a veil and, and leather gloves. Now, what I wear is I wear just the veil over my shirt. I have nylon sleeves that cover my shirt sleeves so they don't crawl up my my sleeves. And I have disposable rubber gloves because the leather gloves are too thick to work with. And when starting a new hive, you need to get some bees. So you can, on the right is um, all the different kinds you can order from. You can see what the prices are. Uh, this is what the package looks like. It's just a wooden box that's screened with the bees in it. It's got a can of sugar syrup to keep so they have food. And it's got a strap that's connected to a queen cage, which is separate. And here's the picture of the queen cage here. And here are some of the hive products. You have honey, pollen, beeswax, propolis. And of course, people raise queens and provide worker bees so other people can start up new hives. Uh, basically, you take, you know, this top thing here is the extractor. You take the frames out of the hive and put them into the extractor and either through a hand crank or through a motor, you centrifugally spin out the hive, you know, spin out the, the honey and collect it collects at the bottom. And there's a little drain from which you can empty it with. If you have beeswax, you could put it in the solar melter. There's usually a little uh, loaf pan at the bottom. It all collects in the loaf pan. If somebody's raising queens, they this picture at the bottom is um, you know the queen cells that are raised and so on. Now, my, <clears throat> I'll get into my personal bee yard here. The bottom left is when I first started the hive. So it's only one deep and uh, the, the colony has survived. The package has thrived and it's doing pretty well. Uh, later on, I add a couple more boxes to it. So this is in the fall. Uh, one of the things that I have in my yard, there are a lot of deer walking through. So I end up putting a lot of fence around it because I didn't want them to <clears throat> run through the woods and knock over the hive. And and what I found out is the lattice fence actually helps. Um, the bees will not fly through the openings and I can actually watch them very close up without having the bees fly into my face. So, so one year I had some damage in the, in the summer and I thought it was the deer that ran into it. But later on, on a December 12th, it was 60 degrees during the day and 60 degrees at night and some bears came around midnight and they helped themselves to one of the hives. And I took a picture of them the next day as they were you know, running through the woods here. And I, as a consequence, I had to redo my D yard. I had to put, get an electric charger, an electric fencer with a solar cell and these wires around it to, to keep the bears at bay. Um, you know, typically the bee club will have a bee uh, inspection demos. This is some uh, beekeeper that did this for, um, for, the, for the club one time. They have over 200 plus hives, if you, you know, and they have a honey house. And because they have so many hives, they have some elaborate equipment to harvest their honey. Uh, if you think about it, if you have 200 hives, you get about 100 pounds of honey per hive. That would be uh, 20,000 pounds of honey per year. And if you sell it for $10 a pound, that's about 200,000 per year uh, in income. 
this is some of the equipment they use. They use an automatic decapper to decap the, the honeycomb. They put it in the honey extractor and it pours out and they put it into these white food grade buckets and they pour that into these other stainless steel tanks, which has a pump and they pump it to fill up their honey jars. So this is really quite an extensive operation. I'll talk a little bit about bee yard location and guidelines. You need something with plenty of nectar pollen sources. You need fresh water within a quarter mile. You need full sunlight. You need protection from the north winds and exposure to the sun south. And you should have e easy access to it and keep a flight of bees away from humans, animals, and traffic. I'll talk a little bit about suburban beekeeping. New Jersey has adopted statewide regulations. Uh, before, some towns could actually prohibit beekeeping, but now all towns and counties must allow for beekeeping, and hives must be annually registered, annually inspected by a New Jersey apiary inspector. Uh, the guidelines are for a quarter acre or less, no more than five hives, and you need a supply of water from March 1st to October 31st. You don't want the bees to get used to water from a neighbor's pool. That wouldn't be a good neighbor. Um, talk about nectar and pollen, pollen sources. In the spring, you get light honey. Um, bees actually get most of their nectar from trees. So you have acacia, linden, maple, chestnut, basswood, and fruit trees. You also get it from some flowers, dandelion, clover, hazel, and so on. In the summer, there's nothing. There's nothing. Um, giving out nectar at the time. In the fall, you have dark honey from sources like milkweed, goldenrod, buckwheat. However, in suburbia, people get allergies from that. And so most of the um, fall foliage has been removed and therefore um, uh, most people don't get any dark honey. So I had the apiaries uh, come by and they looked at my yard and they said, well, I got tulip poplar, I got oaks, I got maples. There used to be linden on the street before Verizon cut it down because they they were interfering with their Fios cables. Um, however, where I am, there's nothing for the fall. And so what that means is I have to feed them sugar syrup to get through the winter. Uh, they have a variety of, uh, I'll talk about some of the pests. Um, you know, if you get Black bear, they'll just take a, a bee yard and just rip it apart. Uh, if you get a mouse, they'll get into the nest. They'll, you know, they'll make a little nest for themselves, and they'll eat the bees' pollen and honey. So it's really no good, and you need to install a metal guard in the fall. Uh, some of the parasites that they have, you know, they have the small hive beetle and the greater wax moth. Here's a picture of the small hive beetle. On the comb, here's a picture of how the wax moth destroys the honeycomb. Um, they have parasites, tracheomites and varroa mites. Here's a picture of the trachea with tiny um, um, tracheomites in it. And here's the varroa mite. You can see two red things on the back of the bee. This is where, um, you know, these things bite through the exoskeleton and they feed on the hemolymph and the varroa has become quite a problem. Um, there's a number of diseases that bacterial, viral, and fungal. You know, I'll just talk about the main one. The main one is American fowl brood disease. If you get that, the only recourse is to burn all the equipment and dis discard everything. Fortunately, it doesn't happen too many times. I, know of only one case in New Jersey where it happened. Uh, there's the European fowl brood, but this is treated with antibiotics. And the other one is Nosema, uh, which is basically bee diarrhea. This is a fungal mycosporian parasite, and it can be treated with fumagellin. However, there's two types. One is Apis and Serrani, and Apis responds well to fumagellin. The other one doesn't. And it's the other one that's becoming a problem now. 
there's also a host of viruses. You know, uh, here's a, uh, the, you know, one of them is deformed wing virus. Here's a picture of a bee that's suffering from that. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. This is a, a short list. There's really dozens of viruses that are out there. So the real big problem is varroa mite. And it was first identified in 1904 in the Eastern honeybee. It shifted hosts in 1940 to the Western honeybee. It was in, inadvertently transported to Europe and South America in the 70s. It appeared on the West Coast in North America in 87. And by 1990, it spread coast to coast. So what that meant is that there were no more feral colonies out, only managed colonies. And, <clears throat> and basically what they do is they lay eggs on the drone and worker larvae, and, you know, and um, so before Varroa, there was one to 3% losses. If you had 3% losses, you were actually a bad beekeeper. After Varroa, the losses were 30 to 50%. And uh, New Jersey does a survey every year, and typically the New Jersey losses are about 33%. Uh, the treatment for this is hard and soft chemicals and other controls. And um, I'll, I'll think I'll skip some of this. There's a thing called integrated pest management. It basically says you cannot eliminate all the pests and parasites, you can only keep them down to below economic thresholds. And as a last resort, in the IPM plan, you use synthetic chemicals and non-synthetic. And sometimes you need a rotation because the resistance are developed to these. Um, I'll, I think in the interest of time, I'll skip this as an example for aurora mites. You know, people can look at it later if they like. Um, I'll talk about agricultural pesticides. Um, there's two types of actions. One is contact, which is toxic upon direct contact. The other one is systemic, which means it's absorbed and incorporated throughout the whole plant. Here are the different classes. I won't go into all of them. Uh, most of them are contact type, but there are a few that are systemic. So over the years, the industry has jumped from one insecticide to another one. And when I attend talks by researchers and they're examining nectar pollen, they basically can find all of them present, including ones that were banned decades ago, like DDT. You know, the toxic toxicity, this is just a table of toxicity and I'll just skip beyond this here. Now, the newest form of nicotinoid pesticides are neonicotinoids. Um, they decided, well, the tobacco plant has nicotine in it. It helps guard it against insects. They said, well, okay, maybe this is a good idea to use this here. So tobacco is one of the nightshade plants. The nicotine is a powerful neurotoxin to insects. It does not contain tropane alkaloids, which are poisonous to mammals. So that's good. So they modified this to be something chemically different. And it guards against sap sucking insects like aphids and leaf chewing insects. And it's applied to the seed of the plant. So it winds up propagating into the leaves, the flowers, the nectar, the pollen. And the problem is it really is in the nectar and pollen. And, um, and the toxicity, LD50, is up to 25 nanograms per B, and it affects their ability to, to sense, return to the hive, and it disorients the B. So it's systemic, it's taken up by the roots, and thus builds up over time. So if the initial levels are below LD50, they increase each year until they're above LD50. Now, Selling neonicotinoids is a big business. Bayer Crop Science is one of the biggest. They're, they have one billion in revenue. Other companies have half a billion, going down to eight million. And some of these are banned in the EU. 
Now, let's say I'm, I have nothing to do with agricultural pesticides and I'm just a home beekeeper. Well, it turns out that you know pesticides are being used for mosquito control and also homeowners that want to spray against ticks. And as a beekeeper, I'm notified. I'm given the location, day, and time of spraying. And the option is to, is to put a net over the hives if its location is too close. I'm notified if they're within a three-mile radius. However, for, bees can forage up to five to eight miles from a hive. So here's comparing a, a commercial orchard with my own home orchard. Previously, this uh, commercial orchard grower was using pesticides with a drum barrel costing $70. Now he has to buy a small canister for $800. He needs to apply something every week to get good results. And I was surprised to find out he was using neonicotinoids. Now, this was used for a hive demo day. They had newly set up um, 20 new beehives at one end. And I had a feeling what they were doing is was an agricultural study to affect the study, uh, what the effect of uh, neonicotinoids are in honeybees. But I never found out if that was the case or what the results were. For my own beehive, I really don't want to treat with, you know, uh, I'm for orchard, I don't want to treat with uh, really hard chemicals. Uh, fruit trees are very susceptible to fungus. They're recommended to prune them vigorously so they air flows through. Um, I elected to use a biosafe solution. And even so, I get this motley looking appearance on the fruit. Now, it still tastes great, but you know, it's not of the type you could sell you know, commercially. Um, the other problem I have is I had a chipmunk. I had 25 apples the first year between two trees. The chipmunk got them all. So, you know, I re it's really, I, I, I wonder somehow how commercial orchards deal with all this. I'll talk a little bit about pollination services. Um, I just want to show a picture of the almond orchards. This is monocrop, you know, agriculture. Um, these orchards go for on for miles and miles. If you look on the right, the way they harvest them is they have this machine that grabs the trunk and vigorously shakes it. And then they have a sweeper come by to do this. I just, I'm just amazed at the size of these almond orchards. Um, I talk about colony collapse disorder. Uh, in 2006, Dave Hackenberg, he's a commercial Pennsylvania beekeeper. He noticed an abnormal phenomena. He went out to his hives and noticed 50 to 80% loss of the hives. The majority of workers disappeared. They leave behind a queen, plenty of honey and pollen, but very few nurse bees. The other bees don't rob the hive. Uh, the wax moths don't come around. The hive beetles come around. No insect wants to touch the stuff. And, uh, and so what are the causes of it? Well, they've looked at it from a variety of um, <clears throat> you know, directions. One is Varroa, viruses, Nasema, pesticides. It turns out a few years before neotinicotinoids were used, you look at malnutrition, transport stress, high exposure, declining genetics, side effects, monoculture farming, cumulative effects was the one thing that was added that was the tipping point. Well, the researchers will not outright blame nicotinoids but the beekeepers claim that this is, you know, it started with use of that. Um, and Dave Hackenberg was actually interviewed on 60 Minutes, if anybody saw that. Um, I'll skip this slide. This is pesticides policies, US versus EU. Many of them were banned. The United States has refused to ban nicotinoids, but several states have restricted its use. Um, this is my own bee yard summary. Um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll kind of, in the interest of time, I'll kind of skip this. I'll go to some uh, fun facts of honeybees. Uh, honeybees uh, feed on bee bread, which is consists of honey and pollen. Workers eat nine kilograms of honey 
to get enough energy to produce one kilogram beeswax. As I mentioned, the brood temperature is 93 degrees. Each larva is fed up, fed as necessary up to 7,200 times a day. Foragers typically fly two miles for nectar pollen, but up to five to eight when necessary. Foragers fly six to nine miles per hour, taking five to 15 minutes per trip and about one to 29 trips per day. Summer honeybees lifelong distance flown is 500 miles. Over their lifespan, the foragers return with about half a milliliter of nectar per trip plus up to 15 milligrams for pollen. So for a full load, uh, that's 30 milligrams or 85% of the empty weight of a honeybee, which is 35 milligrams. The foragers visit anywhere from 100 to 1500 flowers to get a full load of 30 milligrams each trip. And to make one kilogram of honey, they have to visit 1.4 million flowers. Uh, you know, honey has antiviral, antibacterial properties. Uh, you can take honey and mix it with butter, one to one ratio, and it works just like neosporin on skin inf in infections. There's also uh, honey called Manuka honey from New Zealand. It has an additional compound in it, which gives it twice the antibacterial property. And there's also honeydew honey, which is made from the secretions of aphids on pine trees. So if you're considering becoming a beekeeper but don't want the maintenance, um, try mason bees. They're solitary bees. Every female is fertile, makes their own nest. They can fly and pollinate at temperatures as low as 50 degrees. There's no problem with varroa or other pests. They're gentle, not prone to stinging. There's no bees to buy. You don't get any honey and there's no additional work. You can buy a a mason bee house, which is on the right. They're just bamboo tubes. The bees collect pollen and nectar and lay an egg in it. And they put a partition of mud in it and they repeat the process. And the offspring emerge the next year and there's a two year cycle to maturity. Now, if you look at the mason bee, they look more like a house fly, but they have the coloring of a bee. And they're actually very skittish. Like if I see one, they fly away immediately. They don't. They don't want to be around you, you know. So I have like, you know, thing on beekeeping books, journals, organizations, orgs and clubs, researchers, local honeybee sources. If you go to Jersey, Jersey Fresh, there's usually at least one local beekeeper that's selling their honey and wax candles. You can also find them in some stores. And here's some of the contributors to, to beekeeping. If you look, these are some of the researchers here. So if you look at their ages, 85, 95, 98, become a bee, bee researcher, you'll live a long life. Here are some of the other people. I've, I've either have read their books or I've attended their talks. And uh, I'll kind of skip to some of it. Here's some reference links. And I'll skip the summary. And here's the sunflower. I kind of like this. It reminds me of Edward Monk, who did the painting, The Scream. Anyway, so that's the end. I'll open it for questions. Well, I'm sorry there's no time for questions. Uh, we've run out of time. But we will uh, allow just one or two people to make a brief comment. So, Al, would you, would you like to go first? Um, I'm, uh, I'm interested in what mechanism do the bees use to communicate where the honey is in the waggle dance. What's the signaling mechanism? Well, the signal mechanism, mechanism is the actual dance. Yes, okay. but it's, it's done in the dark. And how do the worker bees get the signal? Well, that, that's an interesting question because I actually attended a talk by a researcher that was investigating this. And they really, as far as I can tell, they really don't know. OK. So it's Thank done you. in the dark and they don't know. There's still things that they don't know in spite of all the research being done. Okay, Ron Weinger, please make it brief. Yes, uh, how do they ship these? I mean, if you order bees, do they come UPS or is there a special carrier? And can you buy bees just to add to a hive or they have to come with a queen? Oh, well, what was that last part? Can you buy a bees just to add to a hive or do they have to come 
with a, you know, as a whole new hive with a queen and everything? Well, well, first of all, the way I buy bees is I, I pick them up personally. Okay. Um, there, you know, I, I bought bees from California that actually shipped on flat. The bee packages are actually shipped on flatbed trucks and they make frequent stops to, um, wholesalers, I guess you might call them, you know, and they each get their load of bees. And then I go to one of those people that are, or I, actually they're really real retailers. So I go to them and I pick up the package directly. Alternatively, you can have it shipped through U, USPS, but you know, they don't, they don't really like, you know, handling the bees. They hear the buzzing and they don't, you know, there's a risk of, of them not taking care of it properly not allowing ventilation, keeping it not stored properly. So I generally don't like that option. The other thing is, uh, if you don't want to deal with a package of bees, you can actually buy a small nuke of five frames, which has the bees and, and, uh, and the queen, and you just transfer them to your hive. So that's the other way of doing it. So that speeds up about a month of processing. Okay, uh, let me point out that if there is interest in more discussion of this topic. Um, perhaps we could uh, have it another time. We're going to have an open mic session after the meeting next week, and uh, if we don't have two other, too many urgent things to talk about, we could talk about this. Or we could just dis uh, schedule another discussion. So Bill Tittle, do you have a comment to make, not a question? Oh, Bill, I guess I have to ask you to unmute. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, something like 100 pounds a hive, but each one of these boxes that you have, how much roughly honey do you get out of one of the boxes? Well, I think if you have one deep, you know, which is not the, um, you know, not the honey supers, but if you have one deep that's packed with 10 frames of honey, it's about 70, 70 pounds. But that's usually quite heavy, so that's why they use the smaller honey supers. And they could be like 30, 35 pounds each. And you can get up to like 400 pounds of honey. But usually it's like the Buckfast uh, hybrid that will give you 400 pounds of honey. Okay. Thanks, Walt. Interesting talk. Mark Edelman, you get the last word. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering if somebody ha wants to keep many hives of bees. Do the bees look upon the other hives just as strangers and do they just ignore them or is there some interaction? Well, that, that's actually very interesting. Um, uh, for, first of all, uh, if, you, if you have the hives lined up in a row, it's actually not a good idea, especially with Italians, because what, what happens is you get drifting between hives. You know, the foragers come back and they go, oh, look, this." This hive is good. It's not their own hive, but it's the one next to it. And they don't get um, stopped by the bees in the hive because they say, oh, look, they're bringing back nectar pollen. So they let them, they let them in. So you get something called drifting. Now, other, other species, the drifting problem is less. Okay. The other thing is what a beekeeper can do is sometimes they put a, 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 a bright color at the begin at the front of every hive so the bees can recognize uh, which one is their own hive. The other thing is they can put them at different angles and that way the bee realizes that's not their hive and they'll go to the correct hive. But it, it is a problem, you know, how to keep the bees from one hive to always return to their own hive. So thank you. Art Williams. Oh, thank you very much, Walt. That was a tremendous uh, discussion. I learned a great deal. Uh, the old guard has two ways of thanking its keepers. First, the certificate, which you see on the screen, uh, will be sent to you shortly. Uh, the second way we thank uh, our speakers is the old guard salute. Actually, what I'd like to know is how many people are ready to become beekeepers? <laughs> <laughs> or, or how about at least Mason beekeepers? You don't have to do anything. They'll come to you. You, you don't have to come to them. 
Uh, good question, Walt. I suspect you won't be getting too many uh, takers, but thank you for a very comprehensive review. Um, you know, I learned that a thousand workers die every day and that's got to be replaced by the queen bee. Who knew? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much.